You're listening to Paris Search Radio. News, views and reviews from the world of the paranormal from across the UK and beyond. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web. Paris Search UK Radio. Paris Search Radio, broadcasting to the UK and beyond. The views and opinions expressed by presenters and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Parasearch Radio or its affiliates and sponsors. Listener discretion is advised. You're listening to Kerry Greenaway and Mark Manley on the Dark Mirror Paranormal Show. Only on Parasearch Radio. Good evening and welcome to the Dark Mirror Paranormal Show. My name is Kerry Greenaway and tonight I'm joined in the studio by the lovely Kaz Rooney. Good evening, Kaz. Good evening, Kerry. How are you? I am absolutely fine, thank you. I'm a little excited, I'm not going to lie. You okay? I'm going to paraphrase tomorrow. That's not fair, don't rub it in. I know, I'm so sorry, I have to, I have to do it. It's the first time I've ever done one of these paranormal conventions and I'm a little excited about it. And I'm going to bug everybody when I'm there. It's all the thing you can do, really, isn't it? Wow, isn't this the whole point, isn't it? That's the whole point of it. <laughs> no, I'm really a little excited tonight. So, yes, it's all going to be a very exciting weekend. Very excited. Very excited indeed. Yeah. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> Says Ashley Nibbles in the chat room. <laughs> now, tonight we are going to be talking about one of the founders of the SPR, um, which is... Frederick W. H. Myers. Now I'm a little shocked, to be fair, with this this man. I don't know about you, Kaz. Um, just a little bit. Little shocked. Little shocked. It's a it's a lot different from Arthur, isn't he? Arthur Conan Doyle. <laughs> it's a bit more risky. A little Sh- risky. Incredibly intelligent. I mean, I have to say. Yeah. I mean, I was reading reading up some of his work. Okay. And I was thinking, <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. And, and this isn't even like a book. This is just literally just snippets of, of work he's done. Yeah. Crazy. Crazy man. In fact, the whole little, there was a little sect around that time, and um, which we'll go into in a little bit further detail in a little bit more. Um, but whew, this is quite a big subject and it's quite um, psychological and yes. I hope we do it justice um, but tonight really this is an overview <laughs> because of the amount of work this man did was absolutely incredible now Frederick William Henry Myers now there's a name for you isn't it they had great names back in the day didn't they yeah they're proper upstanding names <laughs> What a better word, the upstanding names. The upstanding <laughs> names. <laughs> he was born in Keswick in Cumberland in 1843. And he was a poet, a classicist, a philologist. A philologist. <laughs> and, and as I said, I found one of the founders of the Society of Cyclical Research. Physical mm. Research. I don't even know how to say that word right. Now, Psychical. Sorry? Psychical. That's the one. So That's you're going to be my mark today. Oh, mark isn't here tonight. Aliens. There you go. Mark's here. <laughs> so you're going to have to do the voices for me. Oh, God, I'm not doing voices. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just thought I'd, thought I'd drop that in at the, the last moment just to give you a little heads up. <laughs> now, he had ideas regarding the subliminal self And they were incredibly influential at the time. Um, And they weren't accepted and on some level still aren't 
really accepted by the scientific community. But they were like, what I got from this was he was like years ahead of his time. Yeah, I think he was. I think he thought out of the box. Out of the box. I think he was like completely out of the ballpark, mate. I think he was like... Maybe out of the planet. (laughs) He was so far ahead of his time. In fact, like I said, there's like a little sex that seemed so far out of their time. Um, But this is all born in in this Victorian era where they had this massive explosion of spiritualism and there was, you know, it was such a fad and, you know, such a fashionista at the time. So there was a lot of, like, you know, people popping up. So there's huge interest in the spiritualism movement at this time. So these these people are sort of, like, taking something that's, like, really fashionista and, and examining it on a completely different level. Yeah. Yeah. So... Anyway, let's have a little look at old Frederick. Now, he was the son of Reverend Frederick Myers and his second wife, Suzanne Harriet Myers Marshall. He was the bro- See, this is where you get the credentials of this guy. He was a brother of poet Ernest Myers and of Dr. Arthur Thomas Myers. And his maternal grandfather was the wealthy industrialist, John Marshall. See? Oh. They ain't a poor family, are they? No, they're quite well to do, aren't they? Very well to do, and not just well to do, but they 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 are, um, you know, they they had the education. I mean, when you when you look at his um, education, it was incredible. He was educated at Cheltenham College. Wow. He went on to Trinity College in Cambridge. Yeah. And get this: by the age of twenty-two, <laughs> I, I just look at this and I go, "Oh my God, what was I doing by the age of twenty-two?" He received two first-class degrees, a littering array of university prizes, including... Now, these these mean nothing to me, guys. Just putting that out there. The Bell, (laughs) Craven, Camden and Chancellor's Medal. They've got to mean something. They've got to be quite highbrow, kind of, you achieved a lot. Prestigious. That's the word. Thank you. Prestigious. Yeah, we'll get through this together, Kaz, I'm telling you now. (laughs) (laughs) Although he was forced to resign the Camden Medal um, after accusations of plagiarism, basically. Although it has since been argued that these were based on a misinterpretation of his motives. And he was a fellow of Trinity College. Again, I'm assuming this is something special. From 1865 to 1874. (laughs) And a college lecturer in classics from 1865 to 1869. Trinity College is actually based in Ireland. Is it? And it is a very well-known college. It's really known for its arts and its music, its art, its writing. It is very well-known. Wow. I don't know. He's uh, incredibly well to do. Is where I yeah. got what I got from that. Whatever, because yes. it all sounds very posh, doesn't it? Well, I had a friend who went to Trinity College. Did you? And she studied studied um, classical music. So I'm assuming this all was new money. All very about the arts. It's all very very much about the arts. Very much Which so. Is, yeah. And I'm assuming this is what we would class as new money back in, you know, they're, they're not from like the, um, or, oh God, autocracy, no, aristocracy, there you go, boom, aristocracy. <laughs> That's Kenny's big word for the night. That's the big word, I'm going to pop that in wherever I can now. Now, <laughs> in 1865, um, he actually published a long poem called St. Paul's, which became popular. We're, we're, I'm skimming over this because we want to get to the juicy stuff, right? Right. The poem included the words of the hymn, Hark, what a sound <coughs> to divine for hearing. Um, and this was followed in 1882 by the renewal of youth and other poems. Oh, he God, he wrote loads and loads of books and stuff and essays and volumes and stuff and he but he was really really focused on Dante and he actually wrote an essay on Virgil which is incredibly well known yeah allegedly (laughs) I love it it's incredibly well known I don't know it but you know apparently it's incredibly well known um now as a young man this isn't going to go down too well I feel (laughs) (laughs) 
Um, he seemed to be. The reports came in, um, or no, not reports. From what I could gather, from what I read on him, um, he seemed to be very, very intense. And not many people very, liked him very much. And some even said that they didn't like like him at all, that they detested him. Okay. It's kind of building up a bit of a character here, aren't we? Yeah. yeah. And he was actually involved in homosexual relationships um, with a guy called Arthur Sidgwick, um, who was one of his closest friends at college. Allegedly, the poet John Addington Simmons and possibly Lord Battersea. So he's bisexual. Well, at this point, I think he was just purely homosexual. But then, if he's in these colleges, weren't they like man and weren't they segregated a, a bit? I think it was like a male thing, wasn't it? Um, back then, I believe so. Um, nowadays, or not, but back then, I believe they were they were segregated. Mm-hmm. I Be think so yeah. too. Yeah. So when you know, you've got to remember. The age and, oh, I'm not even going to go into that side of things. I can't. I just can't do that. Anyway. <laughs> it's not my thing. Anyway, he um, met and fell in love with a lady called Annie Marshall um, around this time. And she had a profound impact on Maya's emotional life. And her tragic death. Um, oh, God, this is awful. I hate this story. Um, added depth and impact to his survival researches. Oh. I know. Now, they met at irregular intervals over the years in London, and she actually attended several seances with him. He was actually really prolific in regards to his okay. research. I mean, once he got... He was a bit like a dog with a bone, this guy. Once he got an idea, he ran with this idea. Do you know what I mean? If he wanted, you know, seances, it was astonishing the amount of research this man did. It was incredible. But that's a good thing, though. Oh, it's in, I'm not craning him for this. I think it's absolutely amazing. It's an amazing thing. I mean, people don't research enough. I'm really guilt. Well, as you know, I'm guilty of that. I don't research places before I go to them. I don't want to. But when somebody's putting that level of interest into something, then you've got to take your hat off to them. Oh, completely. Yeah. Completely. I mean, he was prolific in, in attending seances and, and looking into, um, his, into the work he did. I mean, when we get on a bit further on, you'll understand um, the level we're talking about here. I mean, I was a little bit... Can we dumb it down a bit, please? Yeah. <laughs> when, when we get further into it, because some of the yeah. words that get used are a bit highbrow for my liking. But yeah. this, this is how intelligent this man was. Um, but we have two sides to, to Frederick, um, which we're going to cover both. So, anyway, he fell in love with this Annie Marshall, and she attended several seances with him. Um, and they walked in the grounds of the Marshall family home. This was in Halstead. Um, and he provided her with moral support as she struggled to cope with her mentally ill husband. And she had five children as well. So you can imagine the pressure this poor woman was under. Now, in 1876... I have five children and all that pleasure. <laughs> oh, gosh, I've got two and that's bad enough. Um, <laughs> that's without a husband. <laughs> in 1876, Walter Marshall finally had to be confined to a psychiatric hospital because of his manic behaviour and basically he was spending all their money. <laughs> she was like, I can't have this, I've got to feed the kids. Now, in July of that year, Myers actually left for a tour in the Norwegian Fords with, um, with Arthur. And while he was away, Annie became increasingly um, guilt-stricken over her part in confining her husband. And she actually committed suicide on August the 29th by cutting oh. her jugular with scissors and then throwing herself oh. into the lake. How awful. That is just... Wow, that's brutal. That's serious about doing that's it. That's what I that would is say. <laughs> you know, and now Myers was absolutely distraught and shattered about this, and he subsequently idealised her memory, and Annie became for him a symbol of the type of woman who, like Dante's Beatrice, 
elevated her lover by her beauty of body and soul into the higher spiritual realms. Now, there is no evidence that the relationship between these two was at any time physical. It purely was, I think, a platonic relationship. He was close not just with her, but with the entire family and remained so after um, her tragic death. Um, But, you know, I think at this time he was sort of like... Because he'd had those experiences with males and then this was probably the first female he'd fallen in love with, it probably was sort of a bit confusing. Almost like his first love. Yeah, and I think that probably would have been a little confusing because, you know, a British occult writer Richard Cavendish noted that according to his own statement... Um, he had very strong sexual inclinations, which he indulged. <laughs> but these would seem to have been mainly homosexual in his youth, but later in life was said to be wholly heterosexual. So actually, I think that's quite confusing for somebody, you know. I don't know. I've never been... I've been, I've been basically saying the man's bisexual. Well, he, nowadays, we just go, you know, whatever floats your boat, mate. Do you know what I mean? But it's more yeah, acceptable. It's all... But back then, I mean, we're talking like Victorian times. That's really risky. <laughs> and homosexuality, if I believe right, was illegal. Yes, I believe it was. <laughs> and back in those days. So, you know, I mean, it went on, obviously, but um, it wasn't socially acceptable. No. So, bless him. A little confused, I feel. Anyway, in 1880, Myers actually married Eveline Tennant, and they had two sons, the elder being Leopold Hamilton Myers, again, what a name, and a daughter. Um, The only one worthy of mention is Leopold. And Eveline herself actually became a very distinguished photographer for the family, celebrity friends. And she even has some of her work submitted to the National Portrait Gallery, which is quite a feat. You know, she must have been quite good. Yeah, she must have been really good. Yeah. Now, he had quite a lot of friends, uh, close friends and fellows of Trinity College, Cambridge. The philosopher Henry Sidgwick, let's not get confused with the earlier Arthur Sidgwick, and Edmund Gurney, because Henry Sidgwick is a huge figure himself, so we can't, this isn't, this is more like a mate than it is right, a, okay. a lover. A lover. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my goodness me. I find this so cringy. He then threw oh, himself no, into... <laughs> Honestly, Cass, this is just like... <laughs> this character is definitely a character. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Anyway, he threw himself into investigating mediumship and related abilities and was particularly heartened by his 1874 meeting with William Stainton Moses. Now, again, there's a name for you, isn't it? What a mouthful. Mm. Yeah. I'm so glad they simplified names as the years went on. It's not as bad as the Egyptians, but never mind. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's very, very true. <laughs> now, he was um, William Stainton Moses, was a cleric, a schoolmaster who possessed outstanding mediumistic gifts. I always want to put in brackets, allegedly. Now, with Myers as organiser, <laughs> a circle of investigators began to develop... Um, that was actually based on his intimate friendships, family ties, and the academic and social networks of Trinity College. So out of Trinity, actually, we start seeing this circle of, inv- of initial investigators coming forward. And these included Sidgwick, you know, mm-hmm. good yeah. old Henry Sidgwick, um, the Balfour family and in-laws, the physicist and future Nobel Prize winner, Lord Raleigh, Rayleigh, Rayleigh, Raleigh, uh, Rayleigh, really? him, really? the banker, Walter Leaf, <laughs> and Edmund Gurney. Right now, Edmund Gurney, remember that name, remember Sidgwick's name, because those two are quite key in going forward. Okay, guys, okay. out there, listening, hope you're all listening. Now, um, Edward, Edmund, sorry, Edmund Gurney, oh, Edmund, <laughs> feels like Blackadder moment. Edmund Gurney. Yeah. Would become one of Meyer's most active colleagues. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He was encouraged by Sidwick's um, interest in the field to probe deeper. He paid a heartfelt tribute to his at his mentor's death in 1900. In a starlight walk, which I 
she'll not forget. I asked him, almost trembling, whether he thought that when tradition, intuition, metaphysics had failed to resolve the riddle of the universe, there was still a chance that from any actual observable phenomenon, ghosts, spirits, whatsoever there might be, some valid, some valid knowledge might be drawn to the, a world unseen. And I got it out eventually. I yeah. know. I love that. A starlit walk. It sounds quite romantic. Um, it does sound quite romantic, but it sounds quite confused as well. And it's kind of like, can you prove to us? Yeah, it's like, when it's... I read that, I thought, first of all, they... You can you can set the scene, can't you? These two suited and booted, high to do yeah. kind of characters, highly intellectual yeah. guys walking through, whatever yeah. wherever they were walking, and yeah. you know he was so in awe of this person because he was trembling when he asked him, you know. Yeah. So he he obviously was you know in awe of his mentor. Um, now I think where Myers. What Myers learned from Sidgwick was how to be quite cautious in regard to how yeah. he approaches his investigations and his yeah. accounts. I think he learned that more um, an analytical approach, I want to say. Yeah. Because Sidgwick was renowned for his cautiousness. Yeah, he was. You know, so... You know, and Myers had been going around collecting, you know, seance experiences for a long time and ghost experiences and, you know, yeah. ghost stories for an awful long time. Now, and Myers had a huge respect for Sidgwick's intellectual integrity. So the, the impact that Sidgwick actually had on Myers shouldn't be underestimated, I feel. No, it shouldn't. It shouldn't because it's obviously had a lasting effect. Hugely. And I think that was quite integral into <laughs> how Myers went forward. I think it spurred him forward to go deeper into it. Mm-hmm. I agree. Now, well, he, he, Myers also grew to admire Sidgwick's future wife, Eleanor. Um, yeah. Now, she comes across as an incredibly calm and reason, you know, reasonable, rational, yeah. rational, that's a better word, rational person. Rational. Um, she has, yeah. you know, it's said that she had a very calm approach to cyclical research, and but Myers had fits of exuberance, you know, he was very excited, he used to get very excited about things. So these two people were actually very calming on Myers, and actually honed his mind into being very analytical, um, in yeah. a way where his natural character probably would have got overexcited and, and run with it. These two characters are quite key in his early development of his skill, I feel, coming, you know, coming yeah. into the investigation field. Yeah. Now, at the beginning, this group that they were set up um, investigated mediums for the northern city of Newcastle, <coughs> um, in particular, uh, Miss Wood, Miss Fairlam and the Petty family, and also a number of more fashionable mediums in London. Now, they were quite disappointed with results. Um, Eleanor Sidgwick actually reported at the time that the indications of deception and fraud were palpable and sufficient. So they weren't being... Completely honest. You know what I mean? They weren't being, like, um, completely taken in by these people, were they? No. They were actually looking at it very analytically. I keep saying analytically because it's the only word that I can describe... How well, they I'm at this. so it's it really. Yeah. They've got to analyse everything that's going on. They've not gone into it cold, blind believers. No, they've gone into it in a very rational um, approach, and they're looking at things in a completely different way from the fashionista. You know, I was going to say, you know, it's very easy to be taken in if you want to be, whereas they're not. They're going in very coldly and looking at it in a completely different way. And that there's a lot to be said for that. Yeah, there has to be. Because you have to approach things that way. Really. You okay. really do. Yeah, no, I'm with you. But I think this, these are lessons that we've, you know, that have been brought forward from this time. I mean, when yeah. I started looking at him, I couldn't believe the amount of 
work that they did back then, we still use in this day and age. We have developed, you know, not that much further on, really. No, maybe we haven't. I mean, technology-wise, we have. That measures uh, the environment. But the environment-wise, no, you have to look at what's going on round about you. I don't disagree. Um, I don't disagree with that. But from an actual looking at a medium or from a spiritual point of view, yeah, we haven't really yeah. progressed any further. Now, Myers was actually briefly taken in by the fraudulent American medium, Anna Ava Fay. Um, now, although he was aware of the deceit around him, he did believe some of what he witnessed. Um, and he did think some of it was genuine. But his commitment to the inquiry rarely favoured. So he really, like I say, we go back to dog with a bone. Yeah. He, he didn't just like, oh, well, because I think she's faking this on one level. On, on another level, I do think she's genuine. But, you know, yeah. there's that, lev that double level, isn't there? But I do yeah. think he allowed his emotions to cloud his judgment at times. Which we're all Sometimes. guilty of. Yeah, we are, we are all guilty of that. It's just, when you go into an investigation, you know what you feel. Do you know what I mean? So I can feel a little bit of empathy for the guy because he knows what he feels. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. From a spiritual sense, mm -hmm. I can understand how he feels how he feels. Yeah. Because you can't explain that. So... Mm -hmm. Now, later on, um, just before the SPR was founded, he actually already had... Now, get this. This is astonishing. This gives you an idea of how prolific this man was. 367 seances recorded in his notebook. Well, That's a hell of a notebook. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> now, <coughs> you know, bearing in mind he had done so much investigating, he was really quite despondent by inconclusive results. But he was encouraged by experiments in thought transference. Um, now, this was conducted by a physicist called William Barrett in Ireland, along with Dawson Rogers, who was a leading spiritualist. Barrett urged that a concerted effort be made to examine these matters in a consistent, scientific and balanced way. Now, this led directly to the founding of the SPR in 1882. Now, Myers and Gurney only joined the SPR if Sidgwick would agree to be president. So this is where we all start. This is the founding, founders, foundings of the SPR. Now, Myers contributed to most of the early committees set up by the SPR to investigate mediumship, hauntings and apparitions and such like. Um, and it, personally, he took a particular interest in automatic writing, which he considered in relation to Gurney's work. Remember Gurney from earlier? In hip yeah. uh, his work, he worked in hypnosis an awful lot and to some French experiments in the same field. And he quickly came to um, think that telepathy um, was an important underpinning role and believing its existence to be highly likely um, on the basis of the SPR experiments. Now, we are going to have a look at two of the early, early cases um, of the SPR. Now, one of those is the Creary family Creary. and the Blackburn and Smith family. Now, these are, as I say, these are very, very um, early investigations that, they, that Myers was heavily involved in. Now, in regards to the Creary sisters, right, this was a debunked case, although they were later caught cheating. Because it, it's a really strange case because it's far from obvious that these were actually, you know, it, it's one of those weird ones where, you know, what started as a fun game between sisters yeah. got twisted, took in, their father was very dominant, yeah, pushed them to be, you know, believed that they had a gift got involved with the SPR and the young girls were tested and experimented with 
for a huge amount of time. I mean, at one point, it was like six years of experimentation taken on these girls. That's hot. Can you imagine working as a medium for six years or trying to work a mediumship between or telepathic link between you and your sister for six years? So what started off as probably something very light-hearted, a game, you know, um, that was probably incredibly accurate. Yeah. You know, with that kind of pressure and those kind of strict restrictions, strict restrictions yeah. placed on them under test circumstances. <laughs> yeah. It must have become very boring. Yeah. And a bit dull it lost its fun factor for them the girls this is yeah it's got six years that's an awful long time isn't it that's more than an awful long time that's like a lifetime <laughs> for girls just, yeah yeah that's okay. just horrible it's horrible mm-hmm. so what started off actually is quite a fun game for these girls ended up being a duty and the pressure to you know perform i suppose is the is the word kind of like probably killed the fun and kind of made them want to you know at some point if you're not getting the results they want you then go well let's make something up let's sort of you know give them what they want and maybe they'll leave us alone yeah so anyway they did sort of like get you know debunked i suppose is the expression you know, called out as fakes. Um, but I do think with those two, and there's not a huge information about these two, but that I could find anyway. But um, yeah. they seem to have a gift, but because of the pressure and everything else, it kind of like lost its shine and ended up being not a gift, but down to pressure, I suppose. Basically, the book uses experimental subjects. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, I think this shows, it's actually said, it was indicative of sociological issues regarding Psy as much as the scientific ones. It it showed that it was so stringent and those restrictions placed on anybody with that kind of gift is probably a little unrealistic and not allowing you to be free to do what you do best, quite frankly. Yeah. Now, yeah, I, also they... want, I also wanted to have a look at the Blackburn and Smith investigation. Now, Douglas Blackburn was a Brighton journalist and George Albert Smith was a mesmerist performer on the Brighton stage. Now, the pair apparently took part in experiments with the SPR um, because there was a, you know, I wanted to talk about this case because it actually really is relevant in regards to how we still test people, okay. even in this day and age. And... Um, you can almost see how experiments have evolved from okay. the very early cases of people, how they investigated it yeah. um, back then. Now, um, this was more to do with supporting the existence of telepathy than it was mediumistic abilities. Yeah. Now, um, Myers and Gurney, they travelled to Brighton and tested the pair in a hotel room. Now... Smith was allegedly blindfolded at his own wish to aid in concentration and during the experiment sat with his back turned to the experimenters. Smith, holding Blackburn's hand, was asked to name a colour that was written down by Myers or Gurney and shown to Blackburn. In addition to colours, Myers and Gurney experimented in transfer of numbers, diagrams and random drawings, also of physical pains, often with remarkable accuracy. Well done, him. Mm-hmm. Now, it was stressed that the strictest silence was preserved during each experiment, um, but it's not made absolutely clear in every case whether or not Blackburn held Smith's hand or for how long. And it was noted that on all trials, um, when Blackburn and Smith were in separate rooms, that it failed. Yeah. So it kind of leads to the point of it's not really telepathy then, is it? No, it's not. It's one leaving the other one. (coughs) (laughs) And it was also observed that though Smith seemed to perceive simple geometrical diagrams accurately, 
he generally reversed upper and lower and left and right elements. So it wasn't coming um, in the way that it was being projected. Yeah. So you kind of then sort of think, "Mm -hmm." Mm -hmm. mm-hmm. Now, (laughs) um, Mm -hmm. more in-depth experiments attempted to record and communicate the exact conditions of each experiment so that the reader will be enabled to form an independent judgment by making allowances for whatever mental bias he may discover in his conclusions. So like Smith was seated blindfolded, although sometimes he was allowed to take it off, at a table with pencil and paper and with an SPR committee member beside him, Blackburn would be called out of the room whilst another committee member drew a random figure. Blackburn then would return in silence, position himself sitting or standing two feet behind Smith. Now, there was unbroken and absolute silence amongst all present. So there's no verbal keys going on. Yeah. Any occasion on which Blackburn touched Smith or went within his possible field of vision was noted. And the results are quite impressive. Only eight of the total of 37 experiments recorded were actually unsuccessful. Wow. And four of those were ruled out anyway as the committee had allowed some hand contact between the two of them. Wow. It's quite impressive. That is very impressive, actually. You know, under the circumstances. Yeah, exactly. I mean... Wow. I don't know what to say, but wow. (laughs) I know, it's difficult to know what to say about it, isn't it? Yeah. Now, they thought about the possibility of collusion um, and so the committee stated that tasting, smelling, touch and sight were excluded by the conditions of the experiment. See, the conditions, they, they approached it so scientifically that it's, uh, it's yeah. incredibly cold. You know what I mean? Yeah. They are literally picking it apart. And this is what, you know, we talk about picking cases apart in this day and age and this is what they did yeah. on one specific set of circumstances between two people forget a location they're looking at literally two people yeah and they're picking it apart now they examined the possibility of oral clues being given through whispering or other kinds of audible signs it was unlikely but they hoped by varying the conditions of experiments to exclude it completely so that that's a good that's a good thought pattern They found it difficult to conceive how the detailed and complex signalling required to convey sufficient information for Smith to accurately reproduce the original drawings and in its appropriate proportions could be managed without being detected. Um, And this is what was written. In fact, do you want to talk about it? Do you want to do this? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. With the view of removing all doubts that may arise, that might arise, as to possible auditory communications, we on one occasion stopped Mrs. Smith's ears with putty. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, actually put putty in his ear. Then tied a bandage around his eyes and ears, then fastened a bolster case, long pillowcase, over the head, and overall threw a blanket which enveloped his entire head and trunk. <laughs> They do all that. Yeah, um, but that does not. That reminds me of an experiment that goes on um, even nowadays, right? Called the Gansfield experiment. Okay, Fig- which Fig- is basically Fig- a sensory deprivation experiment. <laughs> Fig twenty two was not drawn by one of us and sh- shown outside the room to Mister Blackburn on his return sat behind Mr. Smith and in no contact with him, whatever, and as perfectly still as it is possible for a human being to sit, who is not concentrating his attention on keeping motionless to the exclusion of every other object. After a few minutes, Smith produced a good representation of the original drawing. He actually copied them. Mm-hmm. The committee, however, was still careful to point out that it was not completely impossible that some kind of code passed on periodic variations in Mr Blackburn's breathing empirical to us may have been in operation. 
I don't think breathing would... It does but, seem highly unlikely. I mean, can you produce a breathing pattern that tells somebody to draw a, a specific thing? It does seem quite unlikely, but... Yeah. But it's a possibility, and if you're looking at it from a scientific point of view, then you suppose you've got to look at it. But I would think, <sighs> yeah. oh, it's not. Um, in this in this report, it was not clear that the experiments took place both in January and April 1883. This has had to be inferred from the dates written on the original drawing, April 20th, 21, 23, and 25th. After this, Blackburn had no further direct connection with the SPR, but in 1884, he published a short book on thought reading in which, while stating that thought reading had been proved, he proved positively that the SPR encouraged his readers to write to the society if they had any interesting experiences to communicate. Yeah. Now, this investigation actually became quite controversial, when following Meyer's death, Blackburn actually publicly alleged that he and Smith had faked the positive results. However, Smith himself robustly denied the accusation. And yeah. Blackburn's personal life, yeah. well, he didn't seem a particularly reliable character, did he? No, not really. And his account of how they actually did it was actually quite inconsistent and contradictory. So, mm, he did call out Gurney and Myers, Blackburn this is, he said there were a couple of credulous spiritualists and wrote, we resolved that we should be doing the world a service by fooling them, sorry, excuse me, fooling them to the top of their bent and then showing how easy a matter it was to take in scientific observations. Okay. Hmm. I think there might have been a little bit of sour grapes there. <coughs> Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Anyway, mm. Myers coined the term telepathy and this soon came to replace thought reading and other similar terms. It concluded that his and others' researches offered at least some evidence that the mind was not totally dependent on the brain and he spent the rest of his life accumulating further supporting evidence in a wide range of areas and he developed a provisional explan... Oh, God. Explanation. Explanatory. Explanatory. <laughs> oh, God. Fr exactly. Words. We get worse. We're As we go on, getting... it gets worse. Framework that linked apparently disparate behaviours and experiences together. Now, in 1883, he and Gurney were suggesting that what they called crisis apparitions, which are those perceived of a person who was at the point of death or in great danger. We've all heard of those. Um, they were caused by a particular form of telepathy. Now, he also suggested that tele telepathic hypnotism could be the source of mesmeric action at a distance. Oh, my God. See, this is where we start getting too clever think... for me. I don't think so. <laughs> I really don't think so. <laughs> Now, Myers actually examined in great detail the role of telepathy in the origin of automatic writing, and he actually identified five possible sources of the writing. Now, I have tried automatic writing. Have you? I have tried it uh, with varying results. Put it that way. <laughs> it's very strange. It is a very pen. strange thing, isn't it? Because you hold the pen in the hand you don't write with. And it's just really strange sensation. Incredibly Which weird. The pen. It's very strange. It is incredibly weird. Yeah. Now, he identified five possible sources for this type of writing. Now, first of all, is conscious will. Okay. Unconscious cerebration. Okay. A higher faculty of one's own mind. Hmm. A telepathic contact with other incarnate minds. Okay. And discarnate spirits and extra human intelligence. See, yeah, I go with the last one. Discarnate spirits and extra human intelligence. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Just feels right, yeah. It's just, it's just 
that weird sensation because you're not moving your hand. You're holding the pen as loose as you can and it just moves. And it just scribbles all over the place until it makes some sort of sense. Unless you've tried it, you don't understand it. Do you know what I mean? But you've tried it. Yeah. It's just, it is very strange. I have to say, I have tried it. Now, yeah. he's, very ca- he's very, very cautious about invoking the fifth option of discarnate intelligence, stating that he would only consider it in exceptional circumstances. And he insisted on the need to be aware of vague, impressive language and of claims to expert knowledge. Now, he looked at one case in particular, which was a Reverend P.H. Newnham, um, yeah. and he attempted to transmit thoughts in forms of questions to his wife, to which she would respond by automatic writing using a planchette. Okay. Now, Newnham, God, can't you say Newham, obtained several hundred fairly, fairly relevant responses, and these suggested to him and to Myers the existence of a secondary self in Newham's wife, characterised by a certain low cunning and creativity that communicated through telepathy. Okay. Now, he didn't actually attend these sessions personally, but he based his conclusions on the reading of Newham's diary. Um, this was in 1871. Well, that's not, that's not good, is it? No, but it shows you that he's constantly it. thinking and looking at... Um, I mean, don't forget, diary writing back in the day was incredibly um, prevalent. Prolific. Prolific. Yeah, well, yeah, it was prolific. Everyone done it. But unless you're actually seeing it with your own eyes. True. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You no, can't miss it. Yeah, it was while he was actually looking at automatic writing that Myers fleshed out the general concept of automatisms that later formed a central aspect of his theory of the subconscious. And he defined an automatism as follows. Such images as arise as well as such movements are made without the initiation and generally without the concurrence of conscious thought and will. Sensory automatism will thus include visual and auditory hallucinations. Motor automatism will include messages written without intention, i.e. automatic script, or words uttered without intention, such as speaking with tongues, trance utterances i ascribe these processes to the action of submerged or subliminal elements in the man's being such phrases as reflex cerebral action or unconscious cerebration give therefore in my view a very imperfect conception of the facts okay and these are concepts we still look at now that's true aren't they yeah, we do. But it's... He's got it's quite just, a deep understanding of psychology. Yeah. But it's one of these things, I mean... You're going to look at it. You're going to look at everything all the way around. Whichever way it, it comes across, you're going to look in depth at it, if you don't look in depth at it, you then you're not you're not really doing it justice, are you? But very, very few people can think I mean you've got to remember that um this was years before Freud. Maya stressed yeah. you know yeah. the importance as a method of accessing the unconscious as a source of creativity of personal insight and of telepathic <laughs> content. Yeah. I mean, he argued that dreams should be subjected to a far more intense analysis of their language and actual and symbolic yeah. content than they had in the past. And he also said we ought to accustom ourselves to look on each dream not only as a psychological observation, but as an observation which may be trans, um, transformed into an experiment. A careful record of dreams might indicate material of a telepathic or clairvoyant nature as in the dream reported by Cyrus Reed Edmonds about the collapse of the Thames Tunnel and the drowning of workmen. He is light years ahead of his time. Light years. 
I mean, yeah, you yes. very, very rarely get somebody who can, uh, you know what I mean? I mean, that's one thing that struck me about this man is yeah. he really was Dug way, into it. way ahead of his time in the way of pe- the way that people thought about things in regard to this kind of yeah. work. Yeah, he dug into it. He really dug in to find explanations. He really dug in to come up with scenarios that could cause it. Um, you've got to admire that. Oh, you, you do have to. You've got to admire his mind because, like I say, you know, it takes yeah. like it's like a one in a million people that can actually um, not just think of a concept. I mean, we can all go, okay, we're going to research the paranormal. Yeah. <laughs> or telepathy or hypnotism or any of these concepts but to actually take it that step further and actually look at it in the way that it's looked at it, yeah there's, it's one in a million yeah it is it really is it really is now yeah, with his work, alongside his work with automatic writing um he went into investigations into hypnotism now gurney was the main experimenter in this field and for this very purpose, he made four visits to France. Um, now, these encounters convinced him that hypnosis offered another powerful tool, tool even, sorry, for experimental psychology and the study of supernormal phenomena. Both his direct experience and his wide reading confirmed his growing belief in the multiplex and plastic nature of consciousness. Yeah. See, under, for example, right, France, Pierre Janet's experiments yeah. with the peasant housewife, Leone, revealed that under hypnosis she displayed three separate personalities, while Auguste yeah. Voisin used hypnosis <laughs> to transform a criminal lunatic into a competent <laughs> nurse. I mean, again, these are like groundbreaking experiments that they're doing using these concepts and these methods. Yeah. You know? And on the other hand, Myers, you know, was very mindful of the possibility of learned behaviour in these sort of cases. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, you know, even and indeed suggested it as an explanation for Charlotte's hypnotic demonstrations. You know, yeah. absolutely crazy. That is bad. I mean, we have literally given you a really, really brief overview of this man's work. He yeah. was incredible throughout yeah. his years. Really pushed the field forward. And that's what's lacking in today's field, I feel. People are still working. They're trying to push the field forward. But when I, when I was reading his work, I actually thought a lot of these concepts and ideas are still what we're looking at today. Yeah, but the question is, how do you push it, push it forward? I don't know. I'm not that clever. Neither am I. So <laughs> you know, but just, we have uh, got people in the field who are incredibly clever, working yeah. and still using these concepts and these very rudimentary experiments that they took, and they progressing those and using the original techniques, but pushing those forward with today's technology as well. It makes me wonder if you could bring Myers forward in time, yeah, for you know, forward in time, and actually yeah. give him the tools that we have today. It makes me wonder what it would do. What the field would be like now. Yeah. Because they only had to deal with the Victorian movement. You know what I mean? Regardless of his, um, you know, anything else, it, it was absolutely phenomenal. I mean, there is so much work that this man did. Absolutely astonishing. It really yeah. was. Yeah. And it was incredible. Well, it does seem, though, in that time there was a melting pot of great minds. A lot of great forward thinking minds seemed to emerge yeah. at the same time. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you, when you think about the Victorian era, you've got yeah. so many fantastic characters that came forward. Um, yeah. Yes, you know. We look at their lives now very coldly, not living it on paper, and, and can make a judgment of that. But 
you can't not think how incredible their minds were for that day and age for that day and age i mean james still in the chat room said very credible society of great minds and shared ideas that is fantastic and it set the scene you know i believe there are rules for the spr you have to know information that cannot possibly be known yeah you know that there are certain you know strict regulations that were set back in the day that now are still current and still relevant in this day and age you know they don't just look at it in a woo woo great it's it's happening way they look at it in a really scientific way and break it down and if you go to the spr you have to have a watertight case they won't they won't just like accept oh i saw a ghost (laughs) (laughs) you know what i mean True. That is very true. But I mean, if we didn't have forward thinking minds, we won't get any any forward. We won't get any further forward. No, and it makes me wonder how many we actually have. That's for great debate, I think. Do we have these kind of minds that are working, or are we still working with the same old methods, the same old original no, I, ideas? I can name at least two people I know who do not work the same as everyone else. Um, they work the way that works best for them, but I can't imagine working the way they work. So. But I do have a lot of respect for them. But there Huge are, amount of respect for them. Yeah, there is a there is a few people who do work things differently. It's not about tech. It's not about um, apps. Apps. I can't stand apps. I just can't, <laughs> I just cannot. Get a lot. I'm not using apps. I just can't use apps. Um, but. Technology-wise, I do rely on technology sometimes. Do you think you rely too much on technology, Kaz? Uh, no. Not too much. Bear but in I mind, do... back in the day, all they had yeah. was observation, exactly. controls that they put yeah. in place. Yeah. And, and I know photography. Who... And I know people who work like that. And I just think that's amazing in this day and age. I think sometimes we can get too bogged down with the tech. Oh, God, yeah. Yes, Knowing your mind is only measuring environmental. Exactly. However. But people, people do rely on the tech too much. Mm. The more I've looked into these characters, we looked at Arthur Conan Doyle, we've looked at Frederick Myers this week. Yeah. It's struck me how we are still quite, in regards to the non-tech side of it, the more psychological side of it, Mm -hmm. we haven't really progressed that far. Not really. No, we haven't. We're still looking at the same concepts. We can't prove them. We're looking at the same concepts they're still relevant that's the point they're still so relevant I understand they're still so relevant but there needs to be a point where we move forward a little bit just a little bit if we could move forward a little bit do you know what I mean maybe we have maybe we have moved forward a little bit but the original amazing brainstorming investigative mental viewpoint of the mind came yeah. from this time and it is incredible what they achieved and on that note we've come to the end of the show Kaz you're joking <laughs> no I'm not joking at all I wish I was <laughs> we didn't even have a break no. Oh, gosh, no, I forgot the break. Oh, my God. Set my wrist. I'll, have to report my, I'll have to report myself to the boss. Why? Well, because, you know, <laughs> slap my wrists and all that. 
Anyway, on that note, that's a, an, an incredibly brief, incredibly brief overview of the amazing Frederick Myers, one of the founders of the SPR. And it gives yeah. you the level that you need to work at if you want to go to the SPR, is all I'm saying. Yeah. Right? Now, on Sunday, I've actually got Rob Lee and Paul Rook in the studio. Now, there is a case called Dear David that's trending on Twitter at the moment. And we're going to break that case down and we're going to look at how you can look at it from a sceptical point of view um, and see things in a slightly different way to the, wow, look, there's a ghost um, kind of view. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Next week, we have shows going out every single night of the week, apart from Saturday. Um, on Monday, we have the Parasurge UK Encore show. Um, now, you need to have a listen to that because there's me and Jay have our brains dribbling out of our ears, thanks to our lovely Richard Clements. Um, on Tuesday, we have the Paraforce Aftermath with um, Sean Cadman, Vivian Powell and Ashley Nib in the studio with us. On Wednesday, we have Haunted Histories. On Thursday, we have the KTPF Reload Show. And on Friday, we have the fabulous Carl Hutchinson in the studio with us. Um, we're talking about, we're doing the Sage, a Sage Paracon aftermath with him and his experiences. We, we had a little chat with Ashley last week. Um, this week, we're having a word with Carl because he was there all weekend, not just for the investigation. So we're going to have a chat to him. And on Sunday next week, I've got the amazing Jane Harris um, talking about um, who put Belle in the witch elm, which is well worth listening to. So we have got some amazing shows coming up for the rest of this week and going into next week. So make sure you tune in. Don't forget, keep as keep checking our Facebook accounts we have a like page and we have a group page and also don't forget we're on youtube as well so if you want to listen to any of our past shows they're all uploaded to youtube don't forget to subscribe so if you miss you know when a new show's gone up and on that note Kaz, what do we say good night we say good night thank you for listening <laughs> we hope you found it interesting and um as i say we only touched the surface of this amazing amazing man thank you so much for listening Thank you for joining us in the chat room and farewell. Have a great weekend. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to join us for more shows throughout the week. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web to keep up to date with all the shows right here on Parasearch Radio.